Science for Aging Calculus on the topic of the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So recall that the second fundamental theorem of calculus is what relates the derivative and the integral. So if you take the derivative of an integral, as long as the lower limit is a constant, then they essentially cancel each other out and you're just left with the original function. The only difference is that x ends up replacing the t, but f is still the same function. So this example problem says the graph of the function f shown below consists of five line segments and a semicircle. And that g be the function given by g of x equals the integral from 1 to x of f of t. So for part a, we're asked to apply g of 5, g prime of 5, and g double prime of 5. So let's start with g of 5. So to find g of 5, you would just look at where the x is or replace the x here with 5. So the integral from 1 to 5. Notice this is t, so we would replace that. So uh, f of t. And we don't have the equation for f of t, but we do have the graph of it right over here. So you just have to remember what the definite integral represents graphically is the area between the curve and the x-axis. So starting at 1 right here, and going to 5 right there. Okay, so to figure out that area, this region right here, between the curve and the x-axis, we can split it up right here into a triangle. So let's find the area of that triangle first if we take one half the base here is two, times the height is four. Two is canceled, you just left with an area of four. And to figure out this region, what we can do is make the area of this rectangle and subtract the area of the quarter circle. So the area of the rectangle, the base is two, times the height is 4, minus the area of the quarter circle, this is the fourth of the circle, would be 1 fourth, 5, you can see the radius of the entire circle would be 2, so 5 the radius squared, 2 squared, and then it would be 8, minus, here 2 squared is 4, that cancels out with 4 and there, gives you this 5. So 8 minus 5 is the area between the curve and the x-axis. So, if you add those up, 4 plus 8 minus 5, you get 12 minus 5. So that's what g of 5 equals. So, what we found is a point, the x coordinate is 5, and the y coordinate is 12 minus 5. Point on, not on the derivative, but on g of 5, on the original point. Next, we need g prime of 1. Well, we don't have g prime yet, so let's start with g of x right here, and let's take the derivative. So to find g prime of x, that means we need to take the derivative of the other side of the equation as well, with respect to x. So it's the derivative of this integral from 1 to x. And here's where the second fundamental of theorem of calculus comes into play. So you can see the derivative of an integral fits the second fundamental theorem. And the lower limit's a constant, upper limit's x, so it fits it exactly. So what that simplifies to be, the derivative and the integral essentially cancel each other out, and we're just left with f, and now all that happens is that x replaces the t. So f of x. And remember, we have the graph of f over here. So what we just discovered is it's not only the graph of f, g prime is equal to f, so this is also the graph of g prime of f. So that's how we can figure out what g prime of 5 is. Since this is the graph of g prime, all we'd be looking at is where, where is the y value of 5. So, see right here, the derivative of 5 is equal to 2. So again, we're just looking at the y value. So this is g prime. Whenever the graph is the same as the total before you, so it's the y value. 
finally, we need g double prime of five. Well, if g prime equals f of x, that means g double prime would equal f prime. So g double prime is the same as the derivative of f. So here's f right here. So the root of f represents the slope. So to find g double prime of 5, you look at the slope at 5. Right there, you can see it's got a horizontal tangent right there. So the slope of the, table, the, slope of the graph is 0. Take a look at part B. It says find g of 1, g prime of 1, and g double prime of 1. So let's start with g of 1 again. That would be the integral from 1 to 1 of f of t dt. But anytime the lower and upper limits are the same, well, there's no area enclosed between 1 to 1. Those, that's always going to give you a definite integral of 0. And then for g prime of 1, again we look at the slope. So if we go back to our graph here, at 1, okay. well, if you look at the endpoints here, so this is on this line segment right here. This point has coordinates 0, negative 2. This point has coordinates 3, 4. So we can just find the slope between those two points and give us the slope right there of 1. It's just all that uh, linear equation. So we take the difference of the y's, 4 minus 2, negative 2, over the difference of the x is 3 minus 8. So you the slope normal. So 4 minus negative 2 over 3 minus 8. You get a 6 over 3. So g prime of 1, the slope of that. Oops, wait. Uh, this is actually g double prime of 5. So we're looking at the slope. It's g double prime of 1. So, because we have the graph of g prime, so the slope there is 2, so that's what g double prime of 1 is. For g prime of 1, that's, we have the graph of g prime, so we're just looking at the y value. So if we go back here, we're going to put this point again right here. You can see the y value is just 0 here. So g prime 1 is. And for part c, it says find all values of x in open interval negative 18, at which g attains a relative minimum. And then just to find your answer. The relative minimums we find by using the first word of test. So if we go back to our graph here, we can draw a number line right underneath our graph that represents g prime of x. So label it g prime of x. And what you're going to look at, since this is the graph of g prime of x, is, again, the y value. Just like we looked at g prime of 5, we looked at the y value there, and g prime of 1, we looked at the y value. Because this is the graph of g prime of x. So whenever the graph is the same as your number line, you're just looking at its y values. In other words, whether it's above or below the x-axis. So you can see the y values start off being positive until negative 7. So negative 7. See the y value is zero. I'm trying to line up your number line directly underneath the graph, so it lines up perfectly. And then we can see the y values are negative all the way until one. So the y values zero. And then the positive y values all the way until the end of our graph right there in eight. 
So we're looking for where G has a relative minimum. So this shows you G is increasing here, decreasing here, and increasing. So when the first vertex changes from negative to positive, that's where you have a relative or local minimum. You can see a graph for the relative or local maximums. You have one right here, negative seven. That's what we're going to change to positive. So now we can say G has, and only ask for the values of x. So we don't need the whiteboard here. A relative minimum at x equals. That's when x was 1. And the way we justify our answer is since t prime of x changes from negative to positive at x equals 1. Then part D says find the absolute maximum value of G on the closing rule from negative A to A. Justify it. So for absolute minimums and maximums, so we still use the first derivative. But it's helpful if you could draw a little sketch of the graph. So we look back here. We saw the graph increasing and decreasing and then back to increasing. So you can see it goes increasing, decreasing, increasing. So let's sketch what that looks like a little bit here. Increasing, decreasing, decreasing. So, the absolute maximum, it could either happen at the relative x here, at negative 7, or it could happen at our other end point of p. So, to determine which one it's at, you just have to compare the y values. So, we just have to compare g of negative 7 with g of 8 and see which one is actually larger. So g of negative 7, just like we found g of 1 here, could be the integral from 1 to negative 7, uh, f t dt, which again represents the area of the curve. However, notice the lower and upper limits are in the wrong order. The negative 7 should be down to the lower limit, and 1 should be in the upper limit. So, because negative 7 is lower than uh, 1. So the way you flip that, remember, is you just turn around and make it negative. And then we change it from negative 7 to 1. So we've got a negative. And then we just have to find, remember this represents the area of the curve from negative 7 to 1. So let's go back to the graph now. So from negative 7 right here until 1 right here, we need this area. Uh, this, you either find the area of the trapezoid there, or if you split it up, Put in a triangle, two triangles and a rectangle. So the area of this triangle, one half, the base is three, the height is two. The twos reduce and you're just left with three, but it's below the x axis. So any areas imposed below the x axis are negative here for the definition of value of the integral. And we've got a rectangle. As base is four. I is 2, so we get 8, but again it's below the x axis, so it's a negative 8. And we've got this little triangle here, 1 half, the base is 1, I is 2, so 2 is this, which gives you 1, but again it's negative. So if you add those up, negative 3 minus 8 minus 1, that's negative 12. But we had to flip it, so the negatives cancel out now. So we get. Now let's compare that with g of 8. So for g of 8, that'd be the integral from 1 to 8 at t dt. This one we don't have to put the lower number limits because they're already in the correct order. So we now have to find the area of the curve from 1 to 8. We have part of that already. Oops. Go back to the graph here. We already know what it is from 1 to 5. So if you keep going there, Put this up. 
we can see this is the same size rectangle, say, in quarter circle here. So since this is 8 minus 5, this is also going to be 8 minus 5. And now we just have this triangle right in here. So if we take 1 half, the base is 1, the height is 4, that gives you an area of 2. So from 1 to 8, if we have these all, 4 plus 8 minus 5 plus 8 minus 5 plus 2, 4 plus 8 plus 8 plus 2 is 22, and then minus 2 pi. So then we just have to compare which of these is bigger, 12 or 22 minus 2 pi. Well, if you approximate pi to be about 3.14 times 2, that would be approximately 22 minus 6.28, which you can see would be a little less than 16, but that's still greater than 20. So our maximum value refers to the y value. So now we can say Twenty-two minus two pi is the absolute maximum value of g on the integral through the terms from negative eight to eight. And then to justify it, if you want to do that, then you can just say. Since we already sketched what it looks like, we've found these values. It's basically since g of 8, that was one possible place, turned out to be greater than the other possible place the maximum could have been at those names. The last part of this example problem, find the x coordinate of each point of inflection on the graph of g on the interval from negative 8 to 8, just by the next so let's go back to the graph now. For points of inflection, that comes from the second group. So now let's draw another number line underneath this one that represents the second group. Now label it G double prime. So in the second derivative, since we have the graph of the first derivative, g prime right here, now we'd be looking at the slope, because the second derivative is the slope of the first derivative. So the slope, you can see, starts out being negative. But right there at negative 7, we've got a corner. So when we have an abrupt change in the slope like that, that's where the derivative of slope does not exist. So at negative 7, it does not exist. And then we can see the slope stays negative until we get to negative 4. Negative 4, we've got another corner, of abrupt change in the slope. So it's, it also doesn't exist there. And then the slope is 0 until we get to 0. Or we get another corner, so it doesn't exist. And then the slope is positive until we get to 3. We have another, we have another corner there, so it does not exist. And the slope is negative until uh, 5. This time it levels off here, it's not an abrupt change, it's a nice smooth curve. So the slope there is zero. Five. And the slope is positive until seven. And then a corner there, so it doesn't exist. And then the slope is negative. So what this shows us about g of x is the concap. So you can see here it's concave down, concave down still. Since it's not positive or negative, it's zero. This is just a linear, it's a straight line. And concave up, concave down, 
quantitative object, quantitative So we're asked to find points of inflection. Those are points where the second order changes sign. So it doesn't change to negative seven, negative four changes to negative zero. From that zero changes from zero to positive, so that's a good matter. Then three, that's the first point of inflection we have. Change of sign. At five, it also changes sign. And at seven, it also changes sign. So those are the x coordinates where the second order changes sign, so that's where we have the points of inflection. So we can say G as points of inflection at x equals 3, x equals 5, and x equals 7. And the way to justify that, and the reason why we knew those were points of inflection, is since g double prime of x changes sign at x equals 3, x equals 5, and x equals 7. Let's take a look at another example now. Here, this one says the graph of f consists of four line segments, as shown below, and that h be the function given by h of x that go from 0 to x of f of t to t. So let's find h of 2, h prime of 2, and h double prime of 2. It says for each of those, find the value or explain why it does not exist. So let's start with h of 2. So for h of 2, all we need to do is plug in 2, substitute in 2 for the x, so we need 0 to 2, f t d t. And again, we have the graph of f of t for f right here. So we're going to go from 0 to 2, so that would be the area of this triangle right here. So that's 1 half, the base is 2, the height is 3. The twos reduce out there, so you just get three, but it's below the x-axis, so it's negative. And then find h prime of two. Oh, we need h prime. So if we take the derivative, h prime of x. Then we should take the derivative with respect to x of this side of the equation as well. You can see again that this fits the second fundamental theorem of calculus. It's the derivative of an integral, and the lower limit is a constant, the upper limit is x. So the derivative of integral essentially cancel out there, and we get h prime of x equals the x just replaces the t in half of x. So again, we know this was the graph of f, and h prime is equal to f. So, this is also the graph of h prime of x, which we So, for h prime of 2, since this is the graph of h prime, we would just be looking at the y values. So, the y value right there at 2, you can see it is 0. Finally, for h double prime, f2. Well, for h double prime of 2, then we'd be looking at the slope. Because h double prime is the slope of h prime. But notice at 2, you've got a corner there. So the derivative or slope doesn't exist yet. We have an abrupt change here. So we can say h prime of 2 does not exist, we abbreviate that E of E. And notice it says find the value, like we did here, or explain why it does not exist. So the way to explain or justify why it does not exist is since, here's where you use limits. So it's the limit as x approaches to, from the left, of h double product, which is 
the slope of h prime. That left hand slope there does not equal a limit as x approaches 2 from the right of h going from it. Now for part b, it says for what values of x in the open interval of negative 4 to 4 is h decreasing? Explain your reason. So the graph is decreasing. That comes from the first vertical. So we have right here. So if we put a number lining in right underneath here. Now label it h prime. So that's what this is the graph of. Here we'll be looking at. And this is right h prime. So whenever the graph is the same as your number line, you just look at the y value. Okay, so the y values start off being positive until negative 2. Zero. And then they're the negative all the way until positive 2. Zero, and then back to positive. So what this shows is about h. slope of h, so h would be increasing here, decreasing. So now I can answer part b, which is decreasing between negative 2 and 2. So h is decreasing on the interval of negative 2 to 2. And explain your reasoning, you can say since h prime of x First vertical is negative less than zero on negative two. For part C, it says for what values of x in the open interval negative four to four is the graph of h concave down and explain the reason. So for it's concave down, well concavity we determine that based on the second vertical. So now we need to draw another number line underneath our graph here. But now it's going to represent each double part of this. And since we're getting h double prime, and this is the graph of h prime, h double prime is the slope of h prime, so now we're looking at the slope. So you can see the slope starts off being negative until negative 2. Well, we've got a corner there, negative 2, so it does not exist there. And then the slope stays negative until it's 0. Or again, we've got another corner, so it does not exist there. And the slope is positive until 2. Another corner, so it does not exist. And and then the slope is positive. So, where is the graph concave down? Concave down is when the second derivative is negative. So you can see here it's concave down, concave down, concave up, and concave down. And because it doesn't exist at negative 2, we do have to stop under our interval there. So we can say h is concave down on the intervals negative 4 to negative 2 and negative 2 to 0. And to explain your reasoning, it says H double prime of x is negative or less than zero on uh, these intervals, negative four to negative two, and negative two. Now let's look at part D on this one. 
It says, on the axis provided, sketch the graph of h on the closed interval from negative 4 to 4. Okay, so let's see what we know about the original function. So we know, right here, h of 2 equals negative 3. So that's a point we know for sure on the original function. Let's go ahead and plot that one first. We know that it goes to the point 2, 3. Or 2, negative 3. From right here. So we can start with that. Now you could find a whole bunch of points here, um, just like we did for h of 2, but there's an easier way. And that's to recall that the definite integral, or the area between the curve and the x-axis of the derivative, not only represents area, it also tells you the change in the original function. So, in addition to that, we can use our number lines here. So I look at the increasing decrease intervals and the current count. So if we find the area of this little triangle right here, one half the base is two, the height is one. So the two's reduced that, you can see the area down the triangle is one. So from the number line, we can see that from two to four, h increases right here. And the area tells us of one tells us exactly how much it increases by. So since it was a negative 3 here, we know that it increases by 1. So at 4, it's got to be up at negative 2. Because it increased by exactly 1. So we can get a very accurate graph here based on that information. Whereas previously, uh, when we had to graph the first one, if we didn't know these exact areas, then we just kind of have to guesstimate what the y value is. So but here we know exactly where it is. So we can say from 2 to 4, it's increasing concave up, these are shaped like a cup. So, increasing concave up like that. And then we can work our way back. We already know the area between 0 and 2 is negative 3, and that shows us exactly how much it decreases by. So if it decreases by 3 to get a negative 3, it must have started 3 above that. So at 0, it must have started up here at 0. That way, when it decreases by 3, that's what will give us to negative 3. Now we can look at our number line and see from 0 to 2, it's decreasing concave up, shaped like a cup. Okay, we'll go that. Try your best to level it off there at three. Sorry, two, because we know at two the slope would be at zero. Then keep working back, and we can see this triangle is the same exact area as this triangle, so it's also negative three. So from negative two to zero, it also decreases by three again. It's decreasing. So if it decreases by three again to get to zero, it must have started up here at positive. So from negative 2 to 0, it's decreasing concave down, shaped like a front. So decreasing concave down, like that. And the final interval, we can see this triangle has the same area as this one. So it's also got an area of 1. So that means it increased by exactly 1 to get to that one. So it increased by 1 to get to 3, it must have started here at and we'll put our number line and see, okay, it's increasing, concave down, shape up. And again, you can see it levels off right there at 2, or negative 2. Because the slope there at negative 2 is. So using the number lines to see where it's increasing, decreasing, and concave up and concave down. In addition to the areas under the curve of the first curve, you can get a pretty accurate graph. And for part E, it says, suppose that f is defined for all real numbers, x, and is periodic with a period length of a. So periodic, remember just like sine and cosine, the trig functions, that means the graph keeps repeating over and over again, looks the same way. And the period length tells you how often it repeats, in this case, every eight units. So the graph shows one period of f, 
So I can see from negative 4 to 4, that's 8 units in width. There. So it keeps repeating this same shape over and over and over again. So it says, first, given that h of 4 is negative 2, find h of 12. So let's start with that part. So when you have a point on the original function, you're looking for another point, but we don't know how the equation, we have the first derivative information about that. That's one of those initial plus change problems. So h of 12, the initial value we're given is h of 4, we know it's negative 2, plus the change comes from an infinite integral from where our initial value is 4 to where we're looking for it at 12. We want to know how much does the function change from 4 to 12. And what goes right here, the change is just the derivative of whatever this function is. In this case, h prime x. Because remember, the definite integral of the derivative tells you exactly how much the original function changes. So h of 12, h of 4, we're told is negative 2. And then plus, well, from 4 to 12, you can see that's just a units wide. That's one more period. Oops. So it's going to look identical to this from 4 to 12, starting from right here, as it did from negative 4 to 4. So if we add up all those areas, 1, negative 3, negative 3, and 1, That'll give us how much it changes by. So you can see it's negative 2. That's negative 4. H of 12 is negative 6. So it changes every period, it basically decreases by 4 units. So that's the first thing we're asking. The next thing we're asked to find is to write an equation for the line tangent to the graph at x equals 85. So for x equals 85, if you want the tangent line, we need two things. We need the point of tangency and the slope. So let's start by finding the point of tangency, similar to how we did this one here. So we want to find h of 85. Well, the initial point we're given is h of 4. Plus, the change this time will come from the integral from 4, where our initial is, all the way to 85. Uh, so again, we know the initial value we're given, h of 4, we know it's negative 2. But this time, to go from 4 to 85, well, we need to figure out, well, how many periods does that represent? The period length is 8. So the way to figure out how many periods it represents is just to subtract up the lower limit from the upper limit. So if we go 85 minus 4, we get 81. That's the width of this interval. And then divided by the period length is 8, we get 10. And... One eighth. So that allows us to split this up and say, okay, well, we know this is 10 of the exact same interval. It's going to look identical. Every period, remember, looks the same thing as it looks from negative 4 to 4. Because it's periodic. It's going to look identical to that. Negative 4 to 4. of x, dx, but there is one left over. So the one that's left over is basically that interval from 84 to 85. That's that last little one that's not part of the, eight, the 10 periods of this Okay, so let's keep going there. 
5, negative 2, plus 10. And we already figured out from negative 4 to 4, the same as from 4 to 12 here, one period, remember that area to the third is equal to negative 4, so it's 10 times negative 4. But from 84 to 85, because it's periodic, we go back to the graph here, that's going to look identical to what it is from negative 4 to negative 3. Because you have that one remainder. So it goes through 10 periods and then one more. So from there to right there. That's going to be the same as it is from negative 4 to negative 3. Well, just like that. It's periodic. Yeah, negative 2, 10 times negative 4, negative 40, and then the area under the curve from negative 3 to negative, negative 4 to negative 3, we'll look back and see, okay, well, it's this little trapezoid here. So if we use the trapezoid formula, area is 1 half, the width is 1, times this height is 1, plus this height is just 1 half right there. So if you have 1 half, times, that's two halves plus one half is three halves, gives you three fourths. The area of that little trapezoid right there is three fourths. That's the area of the curve. So we get h of 85 equals negative two minus 40 is negative 42 plus three fourths. If you get a continent on there, Four. Say, well, that's negative one. If you multiply by four, one sixty-eight over four plus three fourths gives you negative one sixty-five. So that's our y coordinate at eighty-five. So what we've just found is the point of tangent. So we know 85, negative 165 over 4, the point of tangency. So now all we need to know is the slope, so we need to know what h prime of 85 is. So again, just like we did the other one, we're just looking at the y value. And we know 85. Remember the interval from 84 to 85 looks identical from negative three to negative four to negative three. So 85 is going to be in the exact same place as negative three. And you can see that y value is exactly one half. So y value. So that's the slope of the tangent. Okay, and that's all we need. So now we can write down our tangent line. y minus the y coordinate, which is negative 165 over 4, so the negatives cancel out, which is plus 165 over 4, equals, the slope was 1 half, times x minus the x coordinate. Now let's take a look at one more example here. This one says the graph of the function f below consists of a quarter circle, right here, and three line segments. Let g be the function given by g of x equal to the integral from x to 4 of f of t dt. So it says find the average rate of change of g on the interval from, oops, that's sorry, that's part c. Let's start with part a. Find all values of x in the closed interval from negative 4 to 6, for which g of x equals 0. Well, here's g of x. We want to see what makes this equal to 0. So we're really looking for where does this integral from x to 4 of f of t dt, what, what values of x would make this definite for you? 0. Sorry, I wrote that zero twice. So let's start out with the obvious one. Well, the obvious one 
is if this lower limit is the same as the upper limit, if it's 4, then that's what always makes it. So the x equals 4. Now let's see if there's any error else. Well, since that makes this definite equals 0, well, you have to look at the graph and understand this definite integral represents an area into the curve. So basically it stops right here at 4. So we put 5 or 6 there, we can see, well, that area wouldn't be 0 there. Um, we put 3 there, that wouldn't be 0. If we stop there at 2, look what would happen. You can see the area of this triangle. 1 half base is 1, height is 2. It's positive 1. This is the exact same size, except it's below the x-axis, so it's negative 1. So if you integrated from 2 to x, sorry, 2 to 4, you can see the negative 1 and 1 would cancel out, leaving you with 0. So 2 is another answer, another x coordinate, where it would make this definite 4 equal to 0 if we integrate from 2 to 4. Let's keep working back here, see if there's anywhere else. Let's we stop right here at negative 2. The area of this triangle, 1 half the base is 2, the height is 2. To positive 2, and this triangle is the exact same size, but it's below the x axis, so it's negative 2. So the same thing would happen. 2, negative 2 would cancel in addition to the 1 and negative 1, so the overall definite integral from negative 2 to 4 would also be 0. So x, the lower limit, could also equal negative 2. We work back here, that's the only time where the areas below the x axis, uh, above the x axis, would cancel. So there's three answers 4, 2, and negative. So it's just a matter of understanding this definite integral again represents the area under the curve. Okay, so for part B, it says find the x coordinate of each local maximum g on the open interval from negative 4 to 6. So for local maximums, we need the derivative. So g prime of x, the derivative of this integral. X four at the t and t. I notice something a little bit different this time. This time it doesn't fit this second fundamental out there exactly. The reason why it doesn't fit the second fundamental out there exactly is because the lower limit is x and the upper limit is a constant. It should be flipped around the other way. So the way to resolve that, remember, if you want to flip lower and upper limits, you just take that and pull out a negative, make it the opposite sign. So this time, g prime of x doesn't equal f of x. It equals, because we had to flip it, negative the opposite of f of x. So this is the graph of f of x right here. So the graph of g of g prime is the exact opposite of f. So what it would look like is where f is positive, g is going to be negative. It's just going to be basically flipped or symmetrical about the x-axis to f. Because when it's positive, it becomes negative. When it's negative, it becomes positive. So let's try to sketch the graph of that. So here would be this quarter circle down here. Then instead of this one, it would be positive values. It would be these negative values right here. Instead of this segment, it would be up here like this. Negative values would be positive. Instead of these negative values, it would be these positive values. Instead of these positives, it would be these negatives. And instead of 2 there, it would be negative negatives. So this is the graph of g prime of x. Not the original one we're given. It's a little bit different. So using that graph, we could draw a number line right underneath this. And I'll label it g prime of x, since we're looking for local maximums. So g prime of x, we've got positive values. And we look at, this is, it's in green here, this is the graph of G prime, we'll look at the y values. So we've got 
Negative. One degree here. Negative y values until zero. Zero. And then we've got positive y values in green there until three. Or zero. And then negative the rest of the until no stops. So now we can see that g of x decreasing, increasing, decreasing. So we can see we have a local maximum right there at three. So I can say g has a local maximum. Uh, x equals 3, and then to justify our answer, it would be since g prime of x changes from a positive to negative at x equals Now for part C, it says find the average rate of change of G on the interval from negative 2 to 3. So first there's that keyword average. Whenever you're finding the average of a function on some interval, in this case from negative 2 to 3, first thing you have, remember, is the 1 over B minus A on time. In this case, A is negative 2 and B is 3. Let's start off with 1 over. B minus A, so 3 minus negative 2. And then after that, we have the integral from A to B, in this case from negative 2 to 3. And what goes inside the integral is whatever you're trying to find the average of. We'll read carefully. We're not finding the average of G, we're finding the average rate of change of G. Rate of change, remember, is another word for the derivative. So it's the average derivative of G, which is G prime. So that's what we're really finding the average of. So that'd be one fifth on the outside. Now, there's two ways of doing this. One way you could do this was actually integrate g prime. That would give you g, and then plug in three and negative two into g. But there's actually an easier way. And that's to remember we've got the graph of g prime right here in green. So this just represents the area of the curve from negative two to three. So negative 2 right here to 3 right here. So the area of this triangle, if this one was 2, this one would be negative 2. And since this one down here is negative 3 altogether, this would be a positive. So that would be negative 2 plus 3, which is just 1, times 1 fifth gives you 1 fifth. So that's the average value of the derivative, or average rate of change of g on the interval from negative 2 to 3 one fifth. And then part d relates directly to that. It says for how many values c, where c is between negative 2 and 3, is g prime of c equal to the average rate found in part c. So we're looking for where does g, how many times, between negative 2 and 3, does the derivative, g prime of c, equal this average value we got of one fifth. We know it has to equal at least one time, since that's the average. We've got a continuous um, function here. So the way to tell is just think, well, we've got the graph of g prime in green here. So we're basically looking on the interval from negative two, right here, to three right here. Well, one fifth in this graph of one fifth is right here. Right? So from negative 2 to 3, how many times does g prime equal 1 fifth? Well, we can see it intersects right there once and right there one more time. So we can say the answer is 2. There's two values of c. And it'd be since. Different ways to justify this, but it's 
simplest way would be to just say, since the graph of g prime of x intersects the line y equals one fifth, which is what I graph there, two times on the interval from a to 2. See right here, it did intersect with two times. And then part E says find all the intervals on which the graph G is concave up. Explain the reason. So if we go back to the graph, our concavity again comes from the second order. So if we draw a number line here for the second order, label this g double prime of x. Again, since we have the graph in green here of g prime, we'll be looking at the slope. So see the slope starts off being negative cell negative 2, where it does not exist, and the slope is positive all the way until 2, got another corner there, so it does not exist, and then the slope is negative until 4, another corner, so it does not exist, and finally, it levels off the slope, which is zero. So we asked to find where is that concave up. So concave up is where the second derivative is positive. So here it's negative, so it's concave down. Then it's concave up, concave down, and with zero, that's just a linear. Just a straight line. So it's concave up from negative two to two. Say G is concave up on interval negative 2 to 2 and explain the reasoning is since G double prime of X is greater than 0 on interval negative 2 to 2. And that concludes the notes on the topic of the second fundamental theorem of calculus.